we are told that phosphorus burns in pure oxygen with a bright white light. And the product of the reaction is 43.64% phosphorus and 56.36% oxygen. The molar mass of this new compound is 284 grams per mole. What you need to do is determine the empirical and molecular formulas. Now, I'm going to sit back here and I'm just going to, I'm going to let you kind of talk your way through this. Um, so get out a piece of paper and I want you to um, write this out uh, and see if you can come up with the correct answer. Um, if you want to talk to each other and kind of bounce ideas off of each other as you go, feel free to do so. Um, but take a couple of minutes and try to work your way through this problem yourself. And then we'll go ahead and, and uh, uh, show you the answers and work through it together. Sound good? Give me one second, I just need to look up um, one thing. Okay. Okay, so basically to start this problem off, uh, assume it is a 100 gram sample. I just looked up the AMU for oxygen and phosphorus. Oxygen is 15.99, phosphorus is 30.974. Uh, so basically what we need to do is to convert that into moles. Hold on one second. Okay, anybody else get any numbers uh, yet for the moles? Not yet. I like to write the question, but that's why oh, I'm so that's fine. Okay, I don't know the calculation. Um, for the the phosphorus, I got one point four one. No, I'm no one point four zero nine. I would agree. Moles of phosphorus, and then um, let me see for the oxygen. I got three point five two three moles of oxygen and then um you divide 1.409 moles of phosphorus by 1.409 and then you get one mole of phosphorus so divided 1.409 
in the denominator of phosphorus and then put 1.409 in the denominator for oxygen. And you, with phosphorus, you get one mole of phosphorus. And then uh, 409. For oxygen, you get 2.5. Zero, zero. No, you get two point five. Yeah, two point five, zero, zero. But really, you need to multiply two point five by one one half, because it's two and one half. You're trying to get you, so right two and then one half and then multiply by one half, and you're going to get three moles of oxygen. No. Uh, you could just multiply it by two. Okay. Because then you, yeah. Well, then you'll get five. But it's a whole number. Oh. Oh, no. Am I looking at it wrong? Oh, yeah, you get five more. Yeah, I was right. Okay, yeah, I didn't multiply it by the phosphorus, like you said. Is that what you said? Uh, you just so basically since we have a, a a partial number in the bottom you just want them to be holes so you can just right. multiply both of them by two yeah 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 okay yep that's it uh, yep i was trying to sorry it took me so long so, so far so good you're doing well so it says it's it's molar mass is oh it's from the empirical and molecular formula oh okay. yeah the molecular formula part um what is that? uh hold on get the get the empirical first then we'll do the molecular okay yeah then okay yeah the empirical that I mean, we basically have it we just need to write it oh, okay well i thought he did did he not he wrote it right there oh he did write it sorry i didn't see right. it. okay so yeah the molecular uh, the molecular one, I want to say it's the, it's going to be the 284 divided by the molar mass, I do believe. Okay. Well then, let's see. Um, I got phosphorus at, oh, was that what he put? Oh, well then you just put 30.97 plus 16, I guess. And then, which is, oh, no, the molar times it by two. Wait, that's not the molar mass. Wait, you want the molar mass of the empirical form or just the molar mass of? Uh, we need to calculate our empirical mass. So, like, take phosphorus, uh, it's uh, AMU times two, and then the oh, AMU yeah. of oxygen times five. And then we'll take that sum and divide it by uh, the mass, the, the, the molar mass. So for the phosphorus, I got 30.9, no, 61.94. 61.94 for phosphorus. And then for oxygen, I got 80. So 61.94 plus 80. is 141.94 total for the molar mass. I would agree. And then uh, divide the, divide the 284 divided by 141.94, which is 2 point, mm -mm -mm, 2.00. That's it. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I'd say that's close enough just to say two. Yeah, because he said two. Yeah, I remember him saying two. Okay. okay.
<clears throat> so, you know, well done. Good, good job thinking through all the steps. And so, yeah, when, when we're, we're asked to do a molecular formula, that's what we have to do. We have to figure out the empirical formula first. Then we take that empirical formula and we figure out its molar mass, which we did, 141.94. Um, we use that to figure out our multiplier. That's what N is. And so. Oh, I did not understand that part. The P4, P, the P4O10. I didn't know you had to do that. Right. Now, in the example that we did yesterday, our multiplier was one. Our molar mass and our empirical mass were exactly the same. And so that meant the empirical formula and the molecular formula were exactly the same as well. In this particular example, our empirical mass is half of the mass of the molecule, which okay. means that the molecule must be double the mass. And if it's double the mass, then it must be double the formula. Okay. And so I double the formula, which means my two phosphoruses become four and my five oxygens become 10. So my molecular formula ends up being P4O10. Okay. And so that's all that this step is. This is, a, this is the multiplier step. This tells us what number do I need to multiply my empirical formula by to get my molecular formula. Okay, I do have a question on the homework. That just uh, reminded me of something. There was a question in chapter two. It was the seawater one, and it was talking about if the water was evaporated, would there be enough chlorine or something to form uh, but I was confused as to why that answer is. And we can get back to that later. Um, okay. I'm just kind of reminding myself. I'll pull up the question here in a bit. Okay. Yeah, we can, you know, we can, we can talk about that um, uh, during the break or, or after. Okay. Um, um, uh, any, any questions on, on this last little bit from, from chapter two? No. Okay. So, so the real key to these kinds of problems is the is this practice you gotta get practice on it you gotta you gotta work your way through them and so that's why we had the post lecture activity on this that's why there's going to be stuff in the homework that's due tonight uh just keep working at it keep going on it um because uh, there will be a problem uh like this an empirical problem of some kind on the the chapter quiz that's tomorrow uh, so you are going to see these kinds of calculations, you know, popping up. Uh, so just, just be aware. Um, but for right now, um, let's get out of this and move on to chapter three, which is our uh, proposed topic for today. <clears throat> and in chapter three, there's a, there's a lot going on here in chapter three. Um, and we're going to try to address some of the kind of the bigger picture ideas of it. So um, any problems with the, the post lectures that were due for today, the ones that were kind of setting up some of this early chapter three stuff? All right, so let's go through some re review concepts from um, some of those ideas. And so one of the things that we looked at in the uh, uh, review problems for today were the ideas of wavelength, frequency, energy as they relate to light. And so there were two key There are two key equations that came into play with regard to these kinds of, of uh, equations. There was the speed of light equation. Speed of light equation says that the speed of light, C, is equal to the wavelength of light, lambda, in meters, multiplied by the frequency of the light, nu, 
Um, and the frequency of light is measured in hertz or reciprocal seconds. So with C, we get the speed of light. The speed of light is estimated or um, uh, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. We also get in here um, our wavelengths. Our wavelength is measured in meters. And then our frequency which is measured in Hertz, HZ, or um, reciprocal seconds. They, they all mean the same thing. And so this is our first. Is that T times V? No, it's the, it's the Greek letter lambda. Uh, so it kind of looks like a T that's been kind of gently pushed to the side. Um, and that's not a V either. It's, it's the lowercase uh, Greek letter nu. Um, so that's the first equation. We've got the speed of light is equal to the wavelength of light multiplied by the frequency of the light. Um, and we can define these two terms, wavelength and frequency, if we think about light as a standing wave. Now, bear with me with this. I'm, I'm going to attempt to draw using a mouse. Um, so this is pro likely to be somewhat imperfect, um, but let's just assume that there are imperfections. Okay. So that wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. Um, but if we think about the idea of waves, um, wavelength we can measure as the distance between any two peaks on our wave or any two valleys in our wave. Or even just simply any two of the same spot. Uh, can be used to measure and, and for a standing wave like light uh, like electromagnetic radiation, wavelength is going to be consistent value. Now frequency on the other hand, frequency is being measured in reciprocal seconds. This is, let's say that this period of time represented by this black line in the middle represents one second uh, of time. Well, we can see that in this one second of time, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six waves passing in this one second time. This would be a frequency of six hertz. But if I had a different standing wave, This one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. The blue wave here would have a frequency of thirteen hertz. And so, what do we notice about the 
wavelength of our blue lines versus the wavelength of our black lines. It's more rep, it's more, it goes at a faster speed. Well, it's not going at a faster speed. Remember, the speed of light tells us how fast they are going. So they're all going at the same speed. The difference between the blue line and the black line is that the blue line is shorter. So the wavelength. So the wavelength is shorter. Okay. Which means that if I'm looking at that one spot, I'm going to see more of those blue waves go by yeah. in that same second than the black waves because they're shorter, they're smaller. And so that's the relationship between wavelength and frequency. When wavelength is large, our frequency is going to be smaller because the waves are bigger. But when our wavelength is small, our frequency is going to be large because in that second of time, we're going to be able to see more of those waves going by. And the reason we can say that is because they're all related to the idea here of the speed of light. The speed of light is a constant value and it doesn't matter what kind of light we're talking about. It could be cosmic rays coming from the sun. It could be visible light that we are looking at and seeing colors of right now. It could be um, ultraviolet light um, or infrared light or microwaves coming from your cell phone. It could be any, any number of types of electromagnetic radiation. But the relationship here is going to be consistent. And that's where that speed of light equation comes into play. So when we get problems like this, Solving this is not too difficult of a task because we know what the values are that we need to look for. Our speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second is equal to the wavelength of light, 640 nanometers. Now keep in mind for this equation, we have to use meters. So this is where that knowledge of those uh, metric prefixes come in handy easiest way to apply them is, yes, you could take 640 and you could divide it, um, you could multiply it by 10 to the ninth and come up with 6.4 times 10 to the negative sevenths. Um, uh, since most calculators allow you to do this though, what I do is I'll just put in that prefix. I know that one meter has 10 to the ninth nanometers in it, or that, you know, 10 to the negative ninth uh, nanometers uh, uh, is the equivalent on a meter. So I'm just gonna use that as my scientific notation. 640 times 10 to the negative ninth. Now, if you put it into a calculator like this, like, let's do the background, uh, like this, it's probably gonna correct it for you automatically. It's gonna tell you it's 6.4 times 10 to the negative sevenths, and that's okay. Um, it's, the, it's the same value. But it's gonna be that multiplied by the um, frequency. And so solving that out, um, Speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth, divided by 640 times 10 to the negative ninth. And I get a frequency value to three significant figures of 4.68 times 10 to the 10 to the 14th hertz. And so light in the 640 nanometer range, that's actually visible light. That's visible light in the uh, uh, red-orange uh, color range. 
Um, and that's its frequency. So frequencies tend to be pretty large numbers. Um, so what that's telling you is that there are 4.68 times 10 to the 14th wavelengths of light going by every second for that particular wavelength. So there are 4.68 times 10 to the 14th waves that go by you every second for light at that particular um, wavelength. Now this piggybacks into the second equation. The second equation is um, the energy equation. And the energy equation is E is equal to uh, Planck's constant times um, the frequency. So again, let's, let's do a little bit of drawing here, get some context. E is the energy of the light or radiation. H is something known as Planck's constant. Uh, named after Max Planck, the uh, German physicist uh, who uh, is largely responsible for a concept we'll get into later today called quantization. And that value is 6.636 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. And then um, our, our new value, once again, is the frequency, which is either in hertz or reciprocal seconds. So from the previous problem, we already have a frequency. Planck's constant is a constant value so all I need to do is finish this by plugging in the correct values and then multiplying. 6.636 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds multiplied by 4.68 times 10 to the 14th uh, hertz, which is reciprocal seconds, one over seconds. We can see that I have seconds that is being multiplied here and seconds that are being divided there. So my seconds cancel out. I end up with energy is equal to um, 6.636 times 10 to the negative 34th multiplied by 4.68 times 10 to the 14th to three significant figures, 3.11 times 10 to the negative 19th joules for that energy. Now, keep in mind, this is the energy of a single photon of that light. Um, so we're talking about a single light particle having this amount of energy. Obviously, if we encounter uh, red-orange light, we're going to see more than just that one photon. And so the cumulative energy is going to be con considerably higher. Um, the question that we'll always run into is, is it high enough to really do anything? Uh, so any questions about, about these equations or um, you know, how to use them, how to do calculations with them? I have to look more into them, but no. Okay, so in chapter two, we spent a lot of time talking about some early atomic theory. We spent a lot of time talking about some main discoveries that led to ultimately the discovery of the nucleus and also the discovery of the electron. Um, but while those experiments were going on, 
other experiments were also going on that were doing further investigations of electrons and also further investigations of light. And what was interesting is that as they were, as the scientists and physicists of that time were studying light, they came across some really interesting observations. Um, and here are two of the classic experiments that were done in that time. Um, you had Wollaston and Fraunhofer. They're looking at sunlight through a prism. So um, think, think to you know, your old days of, of uh, you know, bending light through glass, looking for rainbows. You know, think about that classic uh, Dark Side of the Moon Pink Floyd album. Um, where you've got the light going into the prism and the rainbow of colors coming out on the other side. Now, what was interesting is when we think of rainbows and when we think of, you know, you know that album cover or, or, or other things like that, we always think of the spectrum as this big continuous band of colors. But what Wollaston and Fraunhofer find is that if they look closely, at the prisms that they are collecting, at the spectra that they're collecting, they're seeing these very, very narrow, dark little lines showing up in their spectra. And that's totally not what they were expecting. Um, and so they give them names, they call them Fraunhofer lines. And um, you know, they start thinking, well, why does this happen? Um, you look at uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff, uh, they're doing similar kinds of experiments. They're using something called a spectroscope. And what they're looking at is um, when you vaporize certain types of elements and you hit them with enough energy, they will emit light. And the light that they emit when looked, when examined through a spectroscope, gives these bright lines. And these bright lines exist in the exactly the same places that the dark lines existed for Fraunhofer and Wollaston. So Fraunhofer and Wollaston have this, you know, band spectrum with very few of these narrow dark lines. Bunsen and Kirchhoff have this dark spectrum with very few bright lines. But the dark lines in the Wollaston and Fraunhofer spectra and the bright lines in the Bunsen and Kirchhoff spectra are in exactly the same places, the exact same wavelengths, the exact same frequencies. So what's going on? So here's an example. This is an example of the, the Fraunhofer sunlight spectrum. And you can see there are places here where we've got this continuous band of light, but we've got these little dark lines kind of popping up all the way through. And so the, the natural question that came up was, well, what gives? Why, why is this happening? And kind of summarizing all of this up, the atomic emission spectra, that is the spectra of bright lines, the Bunsen and Kirchhoff lines, were all being shown when we charged up and caused elements to give off light. And absorption spectra were coming about when um, uh, energy was passing through these elements and, was, and certain uh, uh, frequencies were being absorbed by this, the elements. But regardless of what kind of spectra were being taken, the dark lines and the bright lines were always in the exact same place, always in the exact same spots for a given element. And so just to look at that as a comparison, here are the emission spectrum for hydrogen coupled with the absorption spectrum for hydrogen. And you can see there is a bright line here just around 400 nanometers, and there is a bright or a dark line here right around 400 nanometers as well. There is a bright line here right around uh, 435, 440 nanometers. And sure enough, there's a dark line in that same spot as well. 
There's a bright line here around 500. There's a dark line here around 500. There's a red line here around 650. There's a dark line here around 650. They are occurring in the exact same places. So what I want you to do, put yourself in the shoes of those early 20th century physicists. Talk with each other um, and take a couple minutes, try to figure out why did it occur in the same exact places? What was special about those particular wavelengths? And why don't we see continuous spectra for atoms the same way that we would see continuous spectra for light? So, I'll give you a couple of minutes here. I'm going to duck out um, and just let you try to talk your way through this a little bit. Uh, see what you can come up with. Go ahead. Um, to answer why those specific wavelengths, I feel that that's how long that light was emitted, like the thick of sea light, or that's how long the light lasted, appeared to last. But I'm not that's my that's my answer for wavelength like specific wavelengths like some or the like some may be faster than others or last longer in time in length i don't know if i'm saying it right but And with the why were the wavelengths the same for the dark and bright line spectra? I think that that's that they that they were viewed or appeared at the same amount of at the same that's how long they lasted at that point of speed. Like that's how long they were viewed and lasted under that specific at that specific feet speed. I don't know if I'm saying it right. So I want to do the comments that just paint like white. It is. And it says, why weren't these atomic spectra continuous like white light is? Um, I feel that because they they can they can only last so long and I don't know. It, it, it's a guy. I know it's got to probably do with the speed. I think <laughs> it has to do with the specific element and refraction. Basically, how each element is going to bend that light. You said the fraction. Uh, refraction. Uh, you know, like when you uh, when when sunlight hits like rain and it makes a rainbow, it yeah. splits the light off. Uh, if you shoot light through different elements, it'll like do the same thing. Okay. I mean, if you make them like emit, you can uh, they'll kind of do the same thing. Okay. Don't take that for fact, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, know. I, I think that's what's going on. It's it's just it's it's refraction. Okay. 
Okay. I still think I I if I'm not mistaken, it has to do with the speed, but I could be wrong. And them lasting long lasting the way that lasting the amount of time that they last, but I could be wrong or I may be reading a question wrong. All right. Well, if you're confused or if you're unsure, you're in good company because, you know, again, considering the time frame and considering where these guys, the, the people that were working on this had PhDs in physics and they didn't know what was going on either. Um, so let's, let's get in. We're, we're, we're missing a key part of this that we haven't thought of and we haven't considered. The idea here is something called quantization. Now we've talked a little bit about uh, about energy of light in in the practice problem that we did. What we have to understand is that these atomic emissions are quantized. That means that um, there were only certain energies that were possible for either absorption or emission. So when light comes into the atom, the atom absorbs that energy and is able to graduate to a higher level of energy. And when it releases energy, when it releases light, it goes from a higher energy state down to a lower energy state. Now, what the theory of quantization says is that there are very specific levels of energy that are possible. An atom just can't go from 200 nanometers to 400 nanometers or 200 nanometers to 250 nanometers. It can't just go any old anywhere. That there are specific energy levels associated with, with whatever the wavelengths are. And so when a atom absorbs that energy, it jumps from one of its set levels to another set level. And that's what gets experienced as one of those dark lines. And when it releases energy, it takes energy from one of the higher levels that's set in energy to a lower level that's set in energy. And that energy gap, that energy distance, is a set amount of energy. And that would be shown as a bright line. And so since the energy levels are set and you can only go from one energy level to another and vice versa, your emissions or your absorptions are gonna have set energies as well. There gonna be very specific values that are going to be able to be used. And the person who comes up with this concept overall is Max Planck. Max Planck says that radiant energy, regardless of its source, can never truly be continuous. And that all electromagnetic energy can be broken down into multiples of this elementary unit. The elementary unit is his constant, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. And so when it comes to the idea of quantization, quantization is not something that, thing, that people had come up with and thought of. And it was something that was pretty widely debated. Um, does quantization exist? Does it not exist? Where is it applicable? Where isn't it applicable? And there's a lot of debate that goes on until um, there's a certain physicist from Germany that kind of starts to put an end to the argument. And it's based off of uh, another particular phenomenon, which we'll talk about here in a second. But what I want you to think about, quantization. Quantization versus continuous can be thought of about the, uh, in the same way that there's a difference between stairs and a ramp. Now, if I want to go up a flight of stairs, there's a certain amount of energy that has to be input. If I want to climb this bottom step, I have to put in enough energy in my foot to go exactly this high. 
If I go too high, I skip the step and perhaps I trip over it. If I go too low, my foot gets caught on it and I fall down. So when I'm going up a flight of stairs, there's a very specific amount of energy that it takes to go from step, uh, step one to step two to step three to step four. Very specific amount of energy is required for each of them. And if I want to go from step one to step four, I'm going to have to do a considerably more energy to get up to that height. And likewise, if I jump down off of step four onto step two, that's going to require a set amount of energy as well. So quantization is this idea of discrete and distinct energy levels, these steps, if you will. Whereas continuum states, like what we think of uh, when we, we talk about white light or rainbow, that kind of thing, we can think of as like a ramp. Now in a ramp, there is no place on this ramp that I can't step if I put in the appropriate amount of energy. If I want to stop here on this ramp, I can do it. If I want to stop just a little bit to the left of that, I can do it. If I want to stop here at the top of the handrail and look around, I can. All of the points in between are fair game to me because all of them have a set value that I can reach. But if I want to step here in the middle of the first step and the second step, it's impossible to do so. There's no way that I can elevate myself to this particular height on a staircase, unless I'm somehow capable of levitating, in which case I shouldn't be a chemistry professor, I need to become a magician. Okay, that one fell flat. Uh, but regardless, if, if I wanna go into any place in between these steps, I can't do it if I'm looking at discrete energy levels, if I'm looking at quanta. But if I'm looking at something continuous, I can go anywhere on here and be okay and know that I will be at the exact height that I want to be. And so that's kind of the difference between quantization and, and um, uh, continuous spectra and continuous lines. Let's take a break. Um, we've been going at this for a good hour or so. Um, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to uh, watch a video together um, about a phenomenon that ultimately settles the score on quantization and proves that quantization exists in light and uh, helps to ready the idea that quantization can exist in, um, in uh, atoms as well. It's a concept known as the photoelectric effect. It's uh, ultimately uh, described by a you know, relatively unknown scientist at the time named Albert Einstein. Um, and it's a, it's a good place to kind of get going after a break. So let's come back in about 10 minutes, 10, 20, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. All right. So we're gonna look now at the photoelectric effect. And in our photoelectric effect, um, uh, we're gonna watch a, a video. It's a, it's a real short one, but it's a good one. Um, please let me know if you're unable to hear the audio. Hopefully you will. Um, uh, if not, we'll, uh, we'll do our best to uh, uh, annotate it. So, all right, let's go ahead and watch. Oops. We're in the demo lab with Lonnie, where he set up a photoelectric effect experiment. He has white light impingent on a metal, 
and the energy of the photoelectrons emitted are shown on the meter at right. If he puts a red filter in the path, now only red photons can strike the metal, and you can see they do not have sufficient energy to eject photoelectrons. If we go to higher energy photons, say go to yellow light, that's shorter wavelength and higher energy photons, they may be able to eject photoelectrons. And indeed, photoelectrons are emitted, but with a relatively small energy. If we go to higher still photon energy, green wavelengths, that's shorter wavelength still, higher photon energies, we can see photoelectrons emitted at a higher energy. Now we can still go to higher energy photons. Blue photons, photons in the blue region, are the highest energy visible photons, and Lani has a blue filter that will pass only blue photons. Putting the blue filter in the path shows photoelectrons emitted at the highest energy. So here's an example of the photoelectric effect. Thanks, Lonnie, for that great demonstration. OK, so uh, were you able to hear the audio? Yeah. OK, uh, so that's the photoelectric effect in, in, in its essence. Um, you have light shining on a metallic sample, and you're able to show that electrons are leaving that metallic sample when the light is shining on it. Now, when we put the filters on and we see different colors of light, so we saw red light, yellow light, green light, blue light, how did those filters impact the number of photoelectrons that were emitted? Mm -mm. Right. So of the four different colors of light, which color of light um, had the least impact on the number of electrons that were being emitted? Blue. Okay, we're, we're torn. It, it's one or the other. I'll, I'll give you that much. Is blue or red? You said the least amount or most amount? The least. Blue. And the energy of the photoelectrons emitted are shown on the meter at right. If he puts a red filter in the path, now only red photons. Okay, so we can see here on the multimeter, when the red filter is on, no charge is being emitted by the, the metal. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I can think of it as red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Red starts it. That's the least. Yes. It goes to the right. I mean, it, it shoots up to the right. It goes red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Yeah, so the, so the okay. red light gave us no, no emission. Right, okay. Um, as we went on, the yellow light gave us some emission. The... Um, green light gave us a little bit more. And then finally, the blue light gave us the most. So in terms of the energetics, the red light was the least energetic. The blue light was the most ener energetic. And that was shown by how the multimeter was affected when that filter was put in place. Now the question is, let's just imagine for a second that instead of using this light over here, we used a brighter light. Would a brighter light here have impacted this measurement at all? Uh, yes. Uh, 
Okay, and so you'd be surprised to learn that the answer there is actually no. Because it's the energy that matters. All that intensity does is give you more photons. So if I had a brighter red light here, it's not going to impact, it's not going to change anything because all I mean, that means is I have more low energy photons that are hitting the metal and the low energy photons aren't capable of getting the electrons to move anyway. So it doesn't matter how many I have. Okay. So he could use like a really dim light and it would have gave the same. Output, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So this is what was going on again, turn of the century, 1900 or so. And the phenomenon was tested very, very strongly in a lot of places. And it took this guy, this uh, patent clerk in, in uh, Germany, Albert Einstein, who's sitting around bored in his office. <laughs> and in 1905 comes up with the fundamental idea for why this occurs. And it's the idea of threshold frequency. There's a certain amount of energy that is required to get those electrons to leave. And if the energy of the light is below that threshold frequency, it doesn't matter how brightly you shine it, it is not going to eject any electrons because it has not reached that threshold frequency. Now for light that is above that threshold frequency, we will see the emission of electrons. The difference between, you know, seeing um, just barely registering on the multimeter and big registers on the multimeter is that difference in the gap between the threshold energy and the energy of light that you're actually putting in. And so why did the yellow light just barely spike over the zero mark? Because the yellow light's energy was just barely over the threshold frequency. And the green light was a little bit more because it had a little bit more high of an energy. And the blue light was a little bit more still because it had an even higher energy. And so the threshold frequency is that minimum frequency of light. Obviously, the more, the greater the frequency is, the more over the threshold it is, the more energetically those electrons get ejected. Intensity of light doesn't cover any of that stuff. All it says is, how many photons are we hitting it with? And so the photoelectric effect, this is actually what Albert Einstein wins his Nobel Prize for. He doesn't win it for general relativity. He doesn't win it for special relativity. He doesn't even win it for Brownian motion. Even though all three of those uh, ideas, general relativity, um, Brownian motion, photoelectric effect, all three of those are produced in the same year, 1905. Um, is widely referred to by physicists as the miracle year for Einstein. Uh, a man comes through and, and solves three fundamental questions in one calendar year. Um, quite remarkable. But we still haven't answered the fundamental question that we started this chapter with. And that is, what does any of this have to do with those spectral lines? Well, like I said, it's all a big part of a larger story. And if we start putting it all together, the pieces start to slide into place a little bit more. So the next piece of the story is looking at something called the Balmer series. And so, the Balmer series is looking at hydrogen. So if we go back to those spectral lines for hydrogen that we, that we saw um, early on when we were looking at the atomic spectra, those four spectral lines are referred to as the Balmer series. And um, it's associated especially with hydrogen. And there is a mathematical equation, the Rydberg equation, that equates the transition of those, um, those uh, spectral lines to specific wavelengths based upon energy levels. And so 
the the tie in here that we haven't yet talked about uh, and this is where the photoelectric effect comes in is the idea of electrons electrons inside of an atom are mobile that is those electrons can exist at different amounts of energy and at different energy levels inside of that atom. Now the photoelectric effect focused on the energy level, the highest energy level, where the electrons actually so high in energy that it's no longer part of the atom, it, it gets removed from the atom. But there are other energy levels inside of an atom that have very specific values. So quantization exists inside of the atom and it exists in the electrons themselves. So the electrons have very specific values of energy that they can hold. And so if we give an atom enough energy, the electrons inside of that atom can jump from one energy level to another and come back down from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. And those movements in the energy levels are quantized, so they're very specific values. And those quantized values have very specific wavelengths of frequencies associated with them. So that red line in the hydrogen spectrum corresponds to a jump between the sixth energy level and the second energy level inside of the hydrogen atom. And the Rydberg equation is actually how we can figure that out because it tells us if I know the frequency and I know the origin, um, which for the Balmer lines, all the Balmer lines, um, In the Balmer series, these were emissions that all ended with the electron on the second energy level. So they were going from a higher energy level to the second energy level, higher energy level to the second energy level, higher energy level to the second energy level. Um, and so with the Rydberg equation, you could actually quantify, okay, if I'm going from the third energy level to the second energy level, what kind of wavelength should I expect out of that um, emission? Um, if I want to go from the second energy level to the fifth energy level, what kind of input of energy is required to do that? And so the Rydberg equation here is a powerful tool for doing just that and for doing those kinds of calculations where we can figure out what wavelength do I need to do a particular transition? Or if a transition occurs, what kind of wavelength is going to be required? Or what kind of wavelength is going to be emitted? Now, the Rydberg equation focuses on what are called wave numbers. Wave numbers are just uh, reciprocals of wavelength, uh, um, meters to the negative first. Um, but, um, we can easily flip that over and find wavelength, use wavelength and speed of light to find frequency and energy, um, uh, just like we did in the, the problems at the very beginning of this chapter. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and do an example of the Rydberg equation and a calculation associated with it. The question is this, what is the wavelength in nanometers of the line in the hydrogen spectrum that corresponds to the transition between the fourth and the second energy levels? So for this, we have to use the Rydberg equation, one over the wavelength is equal to RH, multiplied by one over n one squared minus one over 
and two squared. And again, the values of n here, these are referring to specifically the energy levels. That's what these are, these are ultimately referring to, the energy levels in the transition. So I don't know what the wave number or the wavelength is. That's what I'm trying to find. But one over that is equal to the Rydberg constant. The Rydberg constant is, go back here just a second, um, 1.097 times 10 to the seventh. reciprocal meters. And we're going to multiply that by the, um, we're going from the fourth energy level squared minus the second energy, one over the second energy level squared. So if I do my calculations there, um, 1.097 times 10 to the seventh multiplied by um, one fourth squared minus one half squared. I get a wave number of two point um, oh five seven, or excuse me, negative two point oh five seven times 10 to the sixth wave numbers, one over meters. Now the negative here um, is okay. That's a sign convention. When we see negative numbers in energetic calculations like this, that means that the energy is being released, um, which when a at when a electron goes from the fourth energy level, which is higher energy, to the second energy level, which is lower energy, that would be an emission. That would be a release of that light, that energy. So that's okay. To turn this into a wavelength, I need to take the reciprocal. So I'm going to take one over that value, and I get... a wavelength of 4.862 times 10 to the negative seventh meters, which would be 486.2 nanometers. And so if you think back to that, that uh, spectrum that we looked at, that does correspond to one of the spectral lines that we saw, 486.2 meters. If we, if we go back and look, that would correspond to this teal line right here. Um, hold on real quick. Yeah. Uh, you said since we're going from the fourth to the second, that's admission. So if we went from the second to the fourth, it'd be absorption. Yes. And okay. the value would be positive. At, it'd be positive 400. Because we're, we're gaining energy in this one, we're, we're losing it basically. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, that's, that's the common sign convention. Um, negative means energy loss. 
positive means energy gain. Um, and that comes up in a couple of other places um, along the way. This is really kind of our first exposure to that particular sign convention. And so, yeah, technically speaking, this would still be a negative value. I just took the negative off um, since there's really no such thing as a negative wavelength. Um, again, the, it, it's the sign convention that we're, that we're ultimately looking at there. All right, any other questions with this one? No. All right, well then let's look at another one. What is the wavelength in nanometers of a transition between the first and fifth energy levels of a hydrogen atom? And then how much energy would an atom need to absorb for that transition to occur? So once again, we're gonna use the Rydberg equation. One over wavelength is equal to RH times one over, um, in this case, um, we are starting at the first energy level and going to the fifth energy level. And so RH uh, 1.097 times 10 to the seventh reciprocal meters multiplied by one over one minus one over 25 So our wave number is 1.053 times 10 to the seventh reciprocal meters. Again, this is a positive value because this is an absorption now. We're going from a low energy level, the first energy level, up to the fifth energy level. and um, take the reciprocal of that, we would get um, that the wavelength is equal to um, 9.496 times 10 to the negative eighth meters, uh, which is 94.96 nanometers. So what we can see here is that for this transition from the first up to the fifth, um, we're talking about something that's a good bit more energetic because our wavelength is a good bit smaller. From second to fourth, it was uh, 486 nanometers. From first to fifth, it's 94.96 nanometers. Now, yes, the, it's a bigger gap because, you know, from first to fifth is definitely bigger from second to fourth. But the other thing that we need to notice in here also, um, and this will come out when we talk more about the Bohr model, is that as you go up in energy level, the gap between the first energy level and the second energy level is larger than the gap between the second and the third, which is larger than the gap between the third and the fourth which is larger than the gap between the fourth and the fifth. As you go out in energy, 
the energy levels actually get closer and closer and closer together until you hit that threshold point where it snaps and the nucleus no longer has a hold on that electron. It, it's able to escape the, the atom. Now for the secondary question here, how much energy would it take to absorb? Well, that's where we have to go back to one of those equations that we used um, in, in uh, the beginning. Um, e is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. Um, now we can use this equation, or you saw that uh, in a previous slide, we can manipulate that to use wavelength. If we insert the speed of light equation into that um, energy equation, what we get is energy is equal to Planck's constant H multiplied by the speed of light C divided by the wavelength in meters lambda. So since I already have that calculated and these two values are constants, the easier approach would be to just use them that way. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds multiplied by 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by the wavelength 9.496 times 10 to the negative eighth meters and if you follow all the units through, what you can see is my meters cancel with these meters. My one over seconds cancel with these seconds. And so all I'm left with is joules, which is an energy unit. I just need to multiply out the numbers. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th multiplied by 2.998 times 10 to the eighth, divided by 9.496 times 10 to the negative eighth, to four significant figures, I get an answer 2.092 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. Uh, so that's how much energy it would take to take an electron from the first energy level in a hydrogen atom to the fifth energy level in that same hydrogen atom. And so these calculations um, within the Rydberg equation, within these spectral lines are pretty cool. Uh, we can actually use them to do a lot of, of calculating and manipulating and, and so on and so forth. But they do have some limitations to them as well, uh, which we'll get to here in, in just a second. Before we move on though, any questions about, uh, about what we've been talking about so far? Where it says H times C, is that C or E? H times C, H times C, where the 6.626 is. Um, yes, so 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th, that's the value of Planck's constant. C, okay, so that is a C, H C, times C. Yes, C is the speed of light, 2.998 okay. times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, so let's, let's draw some, some net conclusions here. 
When it comes to electrons, electrons inside the atom are at very specific energies. We say that they are quantized. That means that when we look at the electrons inside of an atom, they are going to be at very specific energy values. And in order to go from one energy value to another, they have to absorb an exact amount of energy. So if they want to go up from a low energy level to a high energy level, they're going to have to absorb a certain amount of energy to do so. If they want to go from a high energy level to a lower energy level, they're going to have to emit a certain amount of energy, an exact amount of energy. And that energy that we're talking about is quantized. That's what we see in those spectra, either the bright line spectra for emissions or the dark line spectra for absorptions. And because those spectra, or excuse me, because those energies are set, that's why those emission spectra and absorption spectra had the exact same wavelengths, either dark or bright. And it, we can use the Rydberg equation to ultimately predict when these kinds of transitions would occur and for how much energy. And this equation is useful for hydrogen atom, which is why it's R, that uh, constant is RH. The H there is for hydrogen. But it'll also work for any ion that has a single electron. Now, once we start throwing in a second electron and a third electron and a fourth electron, it gets a lot more complicated and a lot less predictable using the Rydberg equation. But just on the overall in general, that's all that we really need to do. Now, we can summarize these through something called the Bohr model of the atom. And in the Bohr model of the atom, we take those ideas of quantization, we take that, those uh, calculatable quantities of, of quantization from the Rydberg equation, and we start to apply it to an actual model of the atom. And the model of the atom for the Bohr model states that if I have a hydrogen atom, I've got those electrons, and those electrons are moving around in a circle around that nucleus. And so long as the energy of, of the electron, as long as the electrons in that orbit, it's going to maintain a constant energy. It's going to keep going in that exact same way. Now, if it goes from one energy level to another, it's going to jump. It's going to go from a higher to a higher energy state to a higher energy state. Only certain orbits are actually allowed. Every single orbit, every single energy level is going to have a set amount of, of angular momentum, a set amount of energy to it. And so when we see transitions occur from one energy level, one orbit to another, it's going to come with a consistent amount of energy input if we're going up an energy level or output if we're going down an energy level. And those inputs and outputs are going to be shown in the forms of photons of light. So if an if, uh, atom absorbs a photon of light, its electrons will go up in energy. If an atom emits a photon of light, its electrons go down in energy. And that's what the Bohr model does. So the Bohr model gives us a way of kind of picturing this. And it's a very familiar uh, look for us. Um, this is also sometimes referred to as the planetary model of the atom, where you've got the nucleus there in the middle, kind of like the sun in our solar system, and you've got these rings of electrons surrounding it, um, where those electrons are going around that, that nucleus. Now, there are some issues with the Bohr model. We'll talk mostly about those issues tomorrow. Um, but there are some issues with the Bohr model, um, in particular with its lack of flexibility against once we get beyond one electron. We get to two electrons, three electrons, four electrons. 
the Bohr model starts to be a lot less effective um, and a lot less accurate. Um, and so tomorrow we'll kind of conclude our look at modern atomic theory um, by talking about some of the issues with the Bohr model and some of the other discoveries that helped kind of poke holes in the Bohr model, which led us to um, our current model of the atom, which is called the quantum mechanical model. Um, so uh, before we close out today, uh, does anybody have any questions?